Greetings, back again. It's nighttime. Just a little stormy, just a little cold. Perfect night for drawing. So, let's get started. So, on this being November 14th, I received a, uh, a package in the mail yesterday. And that package in the mail was an extra bottle of my preferred black ink that I like to use for my drawing, the uh, Platinum Carbon Black. Now, when I ran out of that ink, I used my spare bottle, and I had to order a new spare bottle, so I did that. And when ordering that spare bottle, I decided to get a recommended ink, which is this Sailor Kiwaguro black ink. This is a water resistant ink and I decided that I would give it a try. It's been recommended to me before and I have been interested to try it and uh, normally I would have bought a, uh, a little sample but I know that with these permanent semi-permanent inks I'm going to use them so having an extra bottle on hand is never a bad thing. So the first thing Let's open these up and see what we've got. The first thing I noticed is that this box is faced with the front of the box here and the flap in the traditional position. Where the flap closes, it folds in the back and it, and it closes in the front. Well, the Sailor ink isn't like that. It folds in the front and it seals in the back. And I thought, well, that's kind of cool. It's uh, also a lovely box. The lettering is raised. It's got a, a very nice texture and a wonderful color to it. It's kind of a like a, uh, a leather kind of look to it. And it's a very nice box with this nice white bold front with the sailor kanji on the front. And so I'm actually looking forward to opening that up. But first I want to open this box up to make sure that everything is okay. Like I said, this box is going to be a uh, spare, and so I want to make sure that nothing happened in transport to my bottle of ink, and the ink is faced with the box. I always like that. It's just one of my little pet peeves. There's no cracks, no chips, no drips, nothing in the box. So we know that this box is good. I'm not going to open the box because I don't want to open the box and then break the seal and then the ink will start to dry out potentially before I get a chance to use it. And since this is my spare ink, it will uh, go into hiding until it is required for service, whenever that might come about. So, with that done, let's take a look at this ink. Now I'm going to use a palette knife. Not last time I used a pocket knife. And uh, my wife told me I shouldn't do that. I was uh, going to be a bad influence. So this week I'm using a palette knife. And I like this box. I already mentioned I like this box quite a bit. And uh, I like the materials on it. This is cool. It's got little shoulders. I guess that's to make sure that the ink doesn't fall out if the box were to pop open and transport. And um, I like the way that this is all faced. That it's all, that it's all upright. Like if it if it were this way, it'd be it'd be upside down. So this is kind of cool. And uh, oh, there's writing on the inside. I do not speak Japanese, or read kanji, so this is meaningless to me. But still kind of cool. I have a feeling that this side is probably the same thing as this side. So let's open it up and see what we've got. And here is our box, faced in the box. And I know I keep mentioning that. I keep mentioning how I like it when my pens are faced. And, uh, oh look, it's got a sticker to tell me what kind of ink is in this cartridge, in this piston converter. And I can, uh, <laughs> too bad I have no ability to utilize these little stickers, but that's kind of a neat thing. And um, I mentioned that things are faced in the boxes. I just think it... It shows that that uh, whoever works for the company has respect for the company. That the company itself requests the requests that their packaging be faced in the box. It just 
It just seems like it's just takes a little bit more care and with the expense of some of this stuff it's nice to see that that it's treated a little more premium than just throw it in a box ship it out this is kind of an interesting cap it's an octagon huh or a deca two four six eight ten deca interesting and i like this bottle it's another good weight bottle very clean very clean shape uniform you can see the ink suspended in the uh, in the glass there that's very cool I like that I like these ink bottles and uh, I wonder why they chose a ten-sided cap in uh, design a lot of times we will see things like like a ten-sided cap and it it, it means something it, it might be part of the emblem or it might be part of a uh, of the uh, the crest of the company in this case I I don't know why it might be that way I like this understated little this understated little applied sticker here too that's nice very interesting and uh, again I like the bottle so let's crack this open and see what we've got inside oh we have a little bit of air that just got in there whenever I open the bottles I like them to be flat on the table because I have opened some bottles in the past where I'm holding them and <laughs> ink drips out. And uh, let's unscrew it until it clicks. There we go. And we take it out. We can see that uh, the cap is has the uh, soft lid in it, so we can reseal this ink easily. And the ink is the ink level is actually right about there, right at the shoulder of the glass bottle, so it won't be hard to fill. And at the same time, there's no threat of overflowing. Now to test the sink, I decided I wanted to try and put it into this Sailor 1911 compass. Now the reason why I decided to use the compass is uh, instead of a uh, 1911 standard, is just because this way, this being a demonstrator pen, we can actually see the ink. I can see the ink and what it's doing inside the pen since this is a new ink i just just clean this pen the pen this pen usually has uh pearl noir uh yot urban or j urban ink in it and uh it cleans out really easily it's a water soluble ink it's an ink that i like to use to push on paper and uh, it is very easy to clean and it comes out of the pen uh, like the pen is practically looking like new. Another reason why I wanted to use a uh, Sailor Compass demonstrator is because that way I can make sure that the pen is absolutely clean, always post your barrel, and that there is no residue of any other ink in this pen so that I can give the ink its best chance for a good performance. Now, there's some debate on demonstrator pens some people call a pen like this a demonstrator, and I've seen them in magazines as a demonstrator pen. This, That's not really quite true. Uh, this is a translucent or semi-transparent pen. A true demonstrator back in the day was a pen that was clear, like a cutaway engine will have the parts cut away so you can see inside and see the workings of the engine. While a, a uh, demonstrator pen is a pen that functions. They have cutaway pens, but they don't function, just as they have cutaway engines. But a demonstrator is one in which you can see all the parts, you can see how it functions, but the pen will actually work too. It's not just it's not just a display item. So let's fill this up. There we go. It's getting late. Perhaps I should go to bed and do this tomorrow. But I think I will just 
suffer through and do this now. In part just because I've, I've already started. <laughs> now unfortunately I've gotten ink into the threads and I don't like that. Normally I brush that out. And I guess I will do that now. I'll just use I'll just use one of these paint brushes here and brush that ink out of the threads. You can see it spattering there as it hits the paper. There we go. Well, not too bad. Now this being a water resistant ink, I don't mind it getting on my paper. Some of these inks, if they're water soluble, I don't like them getting onto the paper all the time just because they, uh, they'll get on me. So that pen is now inked up. We can see that the pen has flowed down and I can see how it, uh, I can see how it's bubbling and settling on the top of the nib. Let's take our box and we will place our ink back in there. I can actually see that the box is as sealed as it was when it arrived. And with that, we are done with this palette knife as well. So, let's take a look at this. Now, in order to get an idea of how much I like this ink, I've decided to compare it to my other Sailor 1911, my Pirate's Life, which also has a medium fine nib. Of course, this is a gold nib. This is a stainless steel nib. But this has the platinum carbon black in it, and this has the brand new Sailor Kiwaguro ink. So, let's try that out on this nice cheap paper this uh this is um this is just you know paper that you get at the supermarket or i think my wife bought this for me at bymart and uh i'm gonna give that pen a moment to settle let's just let's do some writing here on this cheap paper we'll see how we do so this is the sailor Pirates Life, and this is Platinum, and we'll draw some lines. One of the things I like to do when I draw in this book is test for bleed through. And as you can see, the carbon black performs pretty well on this. It absorbs into the paper, but it doesn't really soak through. I even get some bleed through. This is uncoated paper. This is just regular paper. Now let's give this a try. So this will be this will be our. Look, I spelled sailor wrong. Look at that, sailor. Well, one thing I can tell you, this ink is smooth. And this is the Sailor. Kiwa. Now, is it Kiwa Guro? Is that two ink or two words or is it one? And let's write some lines. Oh, it's beautiful. It's wonderfully black. One, two, three. So when looking for semi-permanent inks, I would say that the performance of these inks is almost identical. That ink's still a little wet. That ink is also still a little wet. Similar performance, that's not a bad thing. But one thing I do like is it is very black. In fact, if I don't know if you can see this, but there's also, I think there's a little less sheen. That's one problem that I do have with the carbon black ink, 
is that on some of my drawings, it makes it hard for me to re to uh, copy them, to reprint them, because the carbon black ink sometimes wants to uh, reflect. So I get I I don't get a clean copied line. I get a kind of a sloppy line. So let's try this on a different paper. Claire Fontaine here. I have some Claire Fontaine. This is uh, what A4, A4 pad, spiral ring bound, and this is a coated paper. And let's check out our performance here. So we have the sailor. Parts though. Well, this is a 1911 standard. We'll just put that on there too. And let's make some lines. Won't worry about dry time. Now with this kind of paper, I don't really worry about bleed through. It's usually not a problem. But uh, see, not a, not a problem. But one of the things that I can really see right off the bat is this is a a uh, more velvety black. Now here's the biggest test that I deal with on coated paper, and that's smudging. So let's see. Oh, look at that. We have actually less smudging with the Kiraguro. I thought that there would be about the same, if not more. But um, let's try it over here. Yeah, this is just a little bit better. So, let's take a little water. Do a little water test on these. Because sometimes the pigments want to rise up. As you can see, we're losing definition in these areas. On coated paper, this is where I tend to run into this problem the most. Typically on uh, the less expensive paper, that's why I'm not doing this on the less expensive paper. It's usually not as big a deal. Well, we have a little bit of lifting, but it's not bad. They're actually there. I would say this is a little better, if not comparable to that. So, person who recommended this ink to me. I've had it recommended a couple of times, but this last recommendation is the one I decided to really take to heart. See, you can see, oh, on the cheaper paper, maybe that lifts a little more, but I don't know. I didn't clean my brush in between dousings. Let's try it on these lines over here. Mm, we're going the backwards. I think that, I think I may have lifted carbon out of this. Well, that is interesting, isn't it? I may have a new black ink. Like I said, didn't have much fear of... Oops. Didn't have too much fear about ordering a whole bottle. So, as I was mentioning earlier on, it is nighttime. It is dark. And... We're past Halloween, but not quite to Thanksgiving. And so, this makes it a fine night to draw. Isn't it always on a night like this where it's a little dark, a little cold, a little windy, a little rainy, where we reminisce about stories such as this? It was about this time of year, between Halloween and Thanksgiving, when I was a boy we went to visit my grandparents, who lived up in an area called The Flat. The Flat was located at the end of an 18-mile, one-lane dirt road that ran through Forest Service property. Before we approached The Flat, there was a fork in the road. One fork went down to the river, 
and the other fork ran across to a bridge that went across to the flat, which was like paradise for me. My grandparents lived there, and it uh, was my bulldozers and chocolate chip cookies and fresh made pie, and it was a wonderful place. Well, before you got to the bridge, at the fork in the road, there was stood an old cabin. And in the old cabin lived an old man with his dog. And uh, on the porch of his little old cabin, which was just a, an old mining shack, but he called it home and had resided there for many years, was a large crate. And it was powder blue. And on the side of it was the 20 mule team painted on. And everyone seemed to enjoy the old man and his company. I was always a little standoffish because of his dog. It would always bark. And every time we would approach the fork in the road, the dog would start barking and the old man would always greet us with a wave and would head down to the bridge and cross over to the flat. Well, one day my grandmother wanted to bring him a piece of pie and some cookies that we had made. And I asked her about the powder blue chest that sat on his porch. And she said that he had been a drover for the 20 mule team for the borax mines down in Death Valley. And when the borax ran out, he came up and was running goods for the gold mines. He would be delivering food and equipment out to the mines. And when the gold ran out, he started doing the same thing for the loggers. And when the logging began to slow down, he started working for the Forest Service, and now he ran the pump station where he had the water pumped into a large tank behind his house and would fill the Forest Service rigs so that they could take it up to the campgrounds or take it up into the mountains to the fire spotters' cabins who were there in the summertime. But he was always friendly, and he would always give a wave and a salutation as we would head toward the flat to cross over the bridge. Well, one early morning, we got word that there was a storm coming in, and my grandmother decided that it would be a good idea for us to go to town to put in some provisions in case the road got closed for a few days, which was common during the winter. So we all piled into the station wagon. My grandfather drove us into the city, and uh, we picked up our provisions, and we had a leisurely lunch, and then we headed on back, and we got back around 3.30, where we were just ahead of the rain, and as we pulled up to the fork in the road, the old man's dog was just laying on the dirt in front of the house, and the old man seemingly was napping in his chair. We honked the horn, and we all began waving and called out hello, but he didn't move, and we just headed into the flat. Well, later that evening, after we'd all had dinner and we were getting ready to go to bed, we saw the lights of a truck come up the driveway. My grandfather went to the door, and the ranger was there, and they had a short discussion. My grandfather had been a doctor before he retired to the woods. So while they uh, had their conversation, he spoke to my grandmother, and she went over to the closet and grabbed his Stetson and his Pendleton coat and his medical bag and handed them to him, and he jumped into the station wagon, and they were gone. My grandmother told me that uh, he probably wouldn't be back the rest of the night, so we should just do what we were going to do, listen to the radio, and then we'd go to bed. And certainly that was how it played out. The next morning we got up, Grandfather still wasn't home. At around 4 o'clock that afternoon, he came driving in in the station wagon, and he came to the house very tired. He told us that the night before the old man had passed away, and that he had had to drive him into town in the station wagon in the back because they didn't want to throw his body in the uh, back of an open truck with the storm. And because of the conditions, he didn't want to drive home that same night, so he waited until the storm had passed. Well, it made us a little sad for our Thanksgiving that year, but we were all grateful to be there and all be together and to be with our friends and family. And it made it a little more special that we could remember our old friend who had passed away and we went home. When the summer came, we got back in the car and drove up to visit my grandparents again for the summer. And as we turned the corner, I knew the old man's dog wouldn't be barking and he wouldn't be there to greet us with a salutation. But I was surprised that when we turned the corner 
Not only was he gone, but the cabin was gone as well. So was the water tower. The Forest Service, it was the 60s, and the Forest Service decided it was better to remove the cabin because they had been having issues with squatters taking residence in some of the old mining cabins that dotted the mountainside. So not only was the old man gone, but the cabin was gone too. Well, later that year, we went to a Halloween party. And a boy asked me and my sister if we'd ever seen a dead body. To which we, of course, answered no. And uh, he then went on to tell us a story about how he had gone to a funeral and seen his dead uncle. He never knew him, but uh, he was telling us that it was quite exciting. And he seemed very happy to have something to uh, to lord over us at, the, <laughs> at this party. And as I sat there and thought, I, I realized that when my grandfather had come home that afternoon... He said the old man had passed away sometime after he had eaten his breakfast because the breakfast dishes were still in the sink and he had yet to start preparing his lunch. So they estimated the time of death to be at around 11 o'clock. Well, we had had lunch in town and so when we passed by the old man, he was probably already gone. Somehow it didn't seem right to talk about the old man as being dead so I didn't bring it up and I let the boy have his laughter. And though he's gone and though the cabin is gone, I know that someday I will take that last final drive up a road that no longer exists. And when I pass the cabin, he'll greet me before I cross that bridge to the other side.